nothing like some confounded technology to throw a curveball on a Tuesday morning. So thanks everybody for coming. Um, we've got a nice in-house and remote audience. Uh, today we're gonna we've got Chris Burrows, who's the director of sustainable at Price Industries, also a very nice guy and been around the industry for a while. So I think you'll enjoy what he's presenting. I just wanted to um, have a little forward here. I, a lot of you um, may take a look at um, my blog posts, and there was one that I, I, you know, sometimes I entertain myself by sharing them, but this one was about um, nothing gets nothing gets done without a problem. So we introduced um, to the market chilled beams, I think, in 2010. So that was before Chris was even here, when Jerry Sipes was working at the company, and we had a big meeting at Potawatomi's. Um, convention center and um, the trouble with beams for a lot of folks is there really isn't a problem to solve you know we can get heating and cooling you know somewhat efficiently somewhat inefficiently depending on how you look at it but beams was just more complicated it was more cost um, and so unless there was an owner that was willing to drive it it wasn't going to be something that was going to be adopted widespread with the exception of we have one engineer in the state that does it an awful lot. They do a great job with it. So aside from that, now with, you know, uh, electric beneficial electrification, climate change, or whatever the current phrasing of it is, we have some reasons to be looking at radiant systems more closely. And so I think in the coming years, um, this is gonna be on your radar more often. And the, the subject that we're calling it is low lift decoupled systems. So I think we're just about ready to go. Looking for a high sign from Chris. Almost there. So anyways, if, um, if anything is not working for you remote users, um, please send us a note in the Q and A or the chat and we'll take it from there. All right, and I'm going to mute and get off the screen, and you guys can enjoy Chris Burroughs from Price Industries. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. Sounds like my audio is coming through. Again, as Tom mentioned, uh, definitely let us know if there's an issue with audio or visual. Hopefully you can see me okay, everyone that's uh, logged in there virtually. Uh, so, yeah, thank you, Tom and Airflow, for having this, uh, this type of discussion. Really looking forward to it. We've got a lot of content, so hopefully you're buckled in, ready to go. And uh, yeah, as we go through, um, definitely reach out, you know, ask any questions, send in questions through the chat if you could. Um, I, I do believe we have virtual attendees muted, but if you could send in a chat uh, through the chat, any questions that you've got, um, we'll, uh, we'll get to those. So we've got, I don't know if you mentioned, we've got tickets that we'll be handing out. Uh, if you have any Substantial questions, can't be any question, although we welcome any question, but you know, any question related to the content, uh, we'll give you a ticket, put you into the, uh, throw your name in the hat, and then we've got a couple prizes that we'll do, I think, towards the end of the presentation. All right, so the uh, topic of today is, I'm gonna be self-conscious about the mic falling out, uh, is low lift decoupled systems. This is kind of the initial kick off to the discussion. Has anyone heard of the term low lift? Is that a, yeah, okay, so just, just one or two. So low lift, we'll, we'll define this um, as we go through this section, but you know, essentially, you've probably heard low temp uh, heating, um, so that, that kind of approach, but when you're talking the cooling side as well, um, you know, lower temp is, is kind of the opposite, you know, getting into more milder temperatures for cooling, you know, above 55 degrees, um, both on the heating and cooling side, those are considered to be uh, low lift type of systems. And we'll, we'll go through an example and kind of show really when it gets down to the refrigeration cycle and uh, how that is sort of termed as a low lift type of system. Um, I'll, I'll start off saying I, I don't claim to be a, a heat pump expert, um, but we've got a couple of, of uh, types of air distribution equipment uh, distribution equipment that works well with these types of heat pump strategies, as well as, um, you know, when you're looking at electrified buildings, 
um, in the case of Wisconsin, if you're designing out of state for electrified system, um, or even uh, you know a low energy building that's uh, local, these are really good options uh, to consider going forward. All right. So, so first we wanna start by talking about the energy codes and uh, local laws and trends. It's kind of interesting to see what's happening throughout the country when you look at uh, the ASHRAE 90.1 energy code and uh, sort of that, <clears throat> that uh, code system that we, we look to when designing and, and determining a baseline for these types of systems. And then low lift will define that. Uh, and then decoupled systems, I know we're throwing around a lot of terms here, uh, but decoupled cooling and heating systems how those can help uh, combine with uh, those types of uh, equipment that we see uh, being designed throughout uh, the country. And then we'll go into design considerations and applications. So we'll actually go through examples uh, with a floor layout, some, some past projects that we've done and look at uh, you know, typical load requirements in a space and then how do you lay that out with uh, any type of decoupled cooling system, whether it's a uh, fan powered box approach chilled beam design or underfloor type design. All right, so first up is, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely gonna yeah, bring that up. Can, yeah, can anyone guess what type of uh, HVAC device that is? Yeah, it, there's no right or wrong answer because we I'm not really sure. That is, uh, Mar marketing's shot at a HVAC product. So we kind of left that in there. Is this being recorded? This is being recorded. This can't go live. Um, so yeah, that's that's uh, pretty much a, a radio with uh, wires at the bottom. So next up, I'm gonna keep hitting my computer there. So this, uh, see, so I'm not sure why that's doing that. Apologies for that. So I'll go back to the, the full screen in a second. I'm not sure why those callouts are messed up. Uh, so yeah, this is, uh, this is the, the, uh, the pie chart that I was referring to earlier. So again, just in summary, you've got the space heating, ventilation, and space cooling uh, that total up to over 40% of the building energy consumption. And uh, what that amounts to is, is almost 7 trillion uh, BTUs that are uh, expended or used throughout the year. So we, uh, what we do and how we design these systems is a, a big contributor to the energy consumption for commercial office buildings, um, which is, is probably not a surprise to the group here. So give me one second, I'm gonna go back to... All right, so next up is the ASHRAE 90.1. Um, so I don't know if you've ever seen sort of the evolution of 90.1 and where it's where, it's, uh, where it started in 1975, really kind of within the, the, uh, the context of the, the oil embargo and uh, you know, ASHRAE released the first um, release or standard of the 90.1 ASHRAE or ni ASHRAE 90 at that point. And you can kind of see that for, for several decades, it really didn't move. They didn't move the needle on you know, reducing energy consumption or what that uh, EUI, is expected to be, but really until the uh, 2000s, we started to see uh, some changes to 90.1. So right now, the baseline for 90.1, this thing's testing my PowerPoint skills here. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So 2004, which is the, uh, the first uh, highlighted ASHRAE 90.1 there, that's considered the baseline. So whenever we say 40% reduction from baseline, that is the, uh, the defined energy usage uh, laid out in ASHRAE 90.1 at that release is the kind of that baseline target. So any uh, percentage reduction from that is, is getting us uh, towards the, the, the newer 90.1 ASHRAE. Now, not all states have adopted um, the more recent ASHRAE 90.1 standards, um, but we'll show you in the next slide, you saw that map there for a second, um, kind of the, how they've changed over just the last couple of years. And so currently we have the 
2022, which I, I don't believe any states have adopted just yet. Um, but you can see that that um, energy reduction is, is beyond that 40% there comparing to the 2004. So the, let's see, starting in 2001, or really 1999, there's, there's every three years, they update ASHRAE 90.1. So in uh, 2025, we'll see a new standard that comes out with uh, more likely the same, if not more, uh, restrictive energy targets. So when we looked at the uh, state adoption of ASHRAE 90.1 back in uh, late 28, uh, 2018, uh, you can see that there's, hopefully the color's coming through okay. You see the, the red and orange states are uh, 2007, 90.1. Uh, adopted, you know, statewide. Uh, the states with the white uh, fill-in is essentially no statewide code. Um, so you can see for Wisconsin here, we've got 90.1 2010. And when you move into the, I'll say, I'll say more recent, we've got in April, this is already probably a little bit dated, um, April 2023, you can see that a lot of the map is shifting from red and orange into a lighter green, uh, which is good. So and I'm sorry for those here that, let's see. Just the this guy? That's a little bit better. And then I think if you go to more on the top one, uh, the top of the car, the right, Excellent. Thank you, Tom. Tom for the save. So you can see that, uh, again, we're kind of moving in to, uh, to more green territory. Um, quite a bit of changes in the Northeast. So we got Vermont, Hampshire, New Hampshire, uh, Maine that moved into uh, lighter green and dark green. Um, and Wisconsin stayed uh, level with uh, the 2010. Any questions on that? Anything surprising? Not surprising. Uh, does everybody agree that we're in 2010? I don't know. That's all. That's okay. That is accurate. Okay. We've got one vote for accuracy in the room here. So that's good. Yeah, so we really just show in the general trend of 90.1, um, you know, quite a lot over the last uh, last five years and moving towards a uh, more recent uh, 90.1 codes. All right. Um, this one is actually, uh, I don't mean to tease anybody here. You actually uh, don't have anything mandated or in law. So I apologize for the, I'll call it typo there. Um, but there's several US cities and states moving to all electric buildings. Um, now with that comes its challenges, right? You've got the grid, and also the, the source energy that's being uh, developed to create that electricity. Um, but these are sort of a snapshot of which states, which are shown in the, uh, the green uh, shade, and then cities represented with the stars, which are a little hard to see, but you can see it's, it's really uh, consolidated to the, the West Coast and the Northeast states. Does anybody design um, out of your state locally for uh, projects? that are in other states, any of these states that you design projects for? Yeah, okay. Couple of hands, couple of nods. Um, so yeah, just something to, uh, to keep in mind. So this is why you know, we're having this discussion um, to kind of see what, what the trends look like and also you know, what it might mean for, for our design going forward. So one example of this, being pushed is in the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, and kind of representing this in a several different ways. So the Inflation Reduction Act updated the 179D, which is a tax deduction. And it's based on, you know, depending on how much uh, code baseline energy savings that you outperform, uh, there's a dollars per square foot that's allotted towards um, the uh, tax deduction. That's not a tax credit, uh, but rather a, a deduction there. 
And then uh, in other ways, the energy codes, of course, there's, uh, you know, a, a number of states out there that, you know, have been a little nervous with adopting newer 90.1 uh, energy codes. Um, also, there might be funding issues, budgets, being able to, to work on those updates. And there was $330 million that was allocated for states and local governments to move towards um, adopting a newer 90.1 energy code. So there's there's been money that's uh, divvied, divvied towards that um, effort. And then there's uh, federal buildings as well and infrastructure, um, you know, for government buildings to move towards these these types of uh, more energy efficient systems. Oh, sorry, I moved the camera there. So what is in terms of um, you know embodied carbon and, and net zero? Has anyone heard of MEP twenty forty? No. Okay. So that is a, I'd say newer, a couple of years it's, it's been around, but essentially an affiliation or collaboration of uh, end users or clients and uh, engineers, specifying engineers and architects that are working together towards this uh, 2040 target. So not only is it including the operational carbon um, and be a net zero by 2030, but by 2040, that also would include embodied carbon. So, you know, cradle to delivery, um, embodied carbon to produce the raw materials and, and create the product and get it to the, the building as well. So more of a holistic uh, carbon footprint approach. Uh, what this is showing, this is from architecture2030.org uh, and I keep using my computer, I apologize. So looking at the mouse here, this is showing two, two different trajectories. And the intent here, um, kind of in line with the, the Paris Accord, is trying to keep the, the global warming to um, you know, less than, than 1.5 degrees Celsius. There's a lot of, a lot of things that uh, you know, scientists are projecting that would happen if you've got uh, a degree or two degrees of Celsius and warming of the, the, uh, the Earth. And, um, you know, it might be more frequency of, uh, you know, storms, um, obviously melting polar ice caps, those sort of things that are going to impact uh, the planet that we live in. So these are kind of the, uh, the different trends that um, allow us to reduce the amount of global warming, at least that is contributed by, you know, the systems that we design, HVAC systems. And so just showing the, uh, the 2030 target there in the middle. <clears throat> okay, so getting into the, the people side, you know, um, our day-to-day -day and the, the, the systems that we design, when looking at a low lift system, um, you know, over the last hundred years, we've been using uh, air conditioning to, to cool the space, um, but with heat pumps uh, essentially introduced over the last couple years, um, now we can reverse that that cycle and essentially create heating and cooling with an electrified heating system as well. Um, so how many have designed with a, a heat pump system before? Okay, all right, quite a few hands in the room. <clears throat> so it's a, really the introduction of the, the reversing valve um, allowed us to, to change that refrigeration cycle, reverse it um, so that you can actually reject heat either into or out of the building. Um, so that's novel concept that allows us to, uh, to utilize this heat pump technology. And it's, it's pretty common. Um, I mean, even down in Georgia where I'm at, we've got uh, heat pumps that are used throughout residential as well as commercial buildings. The um, ASHRAE headquarters also uses um, air-cooled chillers and heat pumps combined with displacement ventilation in the uh, conference rooms and collaboration areas and uh, radiant panels throughout the building that do uh, cooling and heating. Um, so lots of different auxiliary uh, components that could be combined with this type of, of system. But uh, really a lot of components that we've, we've seen before. A number of times you got the compressor that's moving the refrigerant throughout the system, and you've got your water uh, pump pushing the water out through this load heat exchanger into and out of the building. And then you might have some air coils with fans um, to, uh, to give off the heat into the, uh, into the uh, atmosphere 
into the ambient. All right, so what does that mean for the heating water temperatures that, that we need or that we can get out of a um, heat pump type technology? So usually, most manufacturers, they claim somewhere in between uh, 75 to, to 140 degrees. I know there's a variation in terms of those limits that they would specify, but this is kind of the typical of what we see. And <clears throat> if you look at the chart on the left side, you can see that once it gets to about 47 degrees ambient temperature, uh, if we just kind of bring that down to about here, you can see that, uh, again, on the x-axis, we've got the outside ambient temperature. You can see that that limit starts to drop uh, dramatically. So for certainly for Wisconsin, you know, it gets pretty cold um, out in the ambient. So that's just something to consider when we're designing with these heat pump systems that, you know, you might have a limited, there's a variable to the uh, leaving hot water temperature with that system. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, just something to keep in mind. And, and uh, you know, again, we'll get to a couple solutions that, you know, can help combine with these systems. And we'll talk about, um, you know, different strategies there. <clears throat> okay. So now that I, I threw the teaser out there for those that haven't heard of low lift, um, what exactly is that, Chris, you might be asking still? Um, you know, when we come to the refrigeration cycle, essentially when we're talking about low lift, you know, we're, we're, um, we could say, how does it work? Pun intended. I've got a lot of terrible puns there throughout the presentation. Uh, so how does work, how does it work? And essentially it's all about the work supplied in this refrigeration cycle. So if you've got uh, 42 degree chilled water that you're trying to create, and then the ambient, uh, uh, temperature, um, outside is going to really drive that uh, lift in the system. So if you're trying to create 42 degrees and then you've got uh, over 70 degrees uh, ambient temperature, that's got a certain amount of lift to it. Uh, you can introduce other technologies besides the ASHP, which is the air sourced heat pump. You've got a, a, a water source heat pump, which is um, can help reduce that lift in the system. And with these decoupled sensible cooling only systems, like say a, a chilled beam, which is shown in the, uh, there on the slides, or a fan powered sensible DOAS box, which you might've heard of before, we'll talk a little bit more about it uh, later today. Uh, those systems take in 56 degrees Fahrenheit chilled water in the system, which helps us get that closer to the ambient temperature. So that's, that's creating a lower lift, better COP, um, with that type of system. So inversely related, lower the lift, higher the COP um, and performance of the system. Now, when pulling, this is a table directly from 90.1. <clears throat> and when comparing with, you know, low lift or heat pump systems, you often hear about 140 degrees Fahrenheit as being the, the temperature that, that we use for the, at least the heating side. Um, but if you just look at the 140 and on the high side and then the medium, which is 120 degrees entry water, and then 105 degrees entry water on the low side, comparing 105 to 140 is a roughly 27 to 30% energy efficiency increase um, just by moving those, those temperatures. So, you know, if you can, design with, with 105, that could also boost the performance of the system. I'm trying to remember, Tom, we, uh, the Michaels building, we had those trough units. I think those might've been 140. There was a project locally that we worked with uh, Airflow on that has a uh, low temp heating uh, trough devices, trench heating and cooling units that use the 140 entry water. Um, to condition the, the, the first floor in the building. Now this is a all glass box, yeah, yeah. You can't miss it, I, I saw it actually yesterday driving, driving by. Uh, so this was a article published in ASHRAE Journal a couple years ago now, 2017, and they were looking at a 
a design with an underfloor chilled beam uh, design and a Hudson, Hudson Yards development area for an office building. Now they used 42 degree water for the DOAS system loop. And then for the underfloor chilled beams, they used uh, 55 degree chilled water um, circulated to those units. So the underfloor chilled beams, I know that might be like a, an odd collection of, of words there. Um, but essentially, uh, those are located flush uh, within the floor, and they've got a, a recirculation component. So you can either uh, pull from the room side air down in through the trough, or you could supply, um, you know, from the underfloor plenum air. It might be ducted to a fan box or just uh, pressurized plenum air. Yep, yep. And we've got that product shown a, a little bit later. Um, but yeah, and approximately, if you look at uh, heat pump manufacturers, they typically will will claim you know two percent energy savings per degree rise in chilled water temperature, which kind of lines up with what uh, they were seeing here from this study. Right. So that did you are you audio? So I'll just repeat what what Tom was saying. The uh, Essentially, that percentage, the cost um, of ener energy efficiency uh, to create a, a BTU yeah, it's not in the system. We made your BTUs, so we saved that much energy. It's just the cost per BTU. Yeah. Right. Okay, so if we just look at a uh, comparison between standard lift and low lift, and of course, we got to put in a couple of assumptions. Um, all that is represented down below in the fine print. Uh, you know, with standard lift systems, you do have a higher delta T with, uh, with the, the, you know, the chilled water temperatures. You've got lower chilled water, in this case, 42 degree water, um, less GPMs because you've got more energy, you know, cooler water th running throughout the building. Um, but the horsepower, if you look at the kind of the, the right side and at the bottom, we've got a, a reduction in the amount of horsepower that we need um, throughout the building and really on the, the chiller side, right? Not the, the pump side, because we're still moving um, more GPM throughout the building because we've got less lower water temperatures for cooling. Um, but you can, you can kind of see that played out in, the, in terms of the, the uh, horsepower required for the chiller system. Uh, so this was looking at about a million BTUs per hour for a space that's uh, 200 uh, feet by 200 feet, uh, assuming a load of 25 BTUs per hour per square foot. <clears throat> so again, we see that 23%, 23.5% uh, reduction by going to that uh, low lift system. All right, so let's get into the intro. Are there any questions before I... Uh, I move on and I'm not, let's see, do I see where the, in the chat, any questions? I'm watching. Okay, thanks. Again, please uh, send in questions if you've got um, anything into the chat and we'll, uh, we'll uh, bring those up. Okay, so how exactly does this work? We've got on the water side design, you know, really it's, it's all about shifting the energy transport in the building to the, the hydronic and water side. And you've got um, water, if you, if you look at the transportation energy, um, you know, in terms of the, the ton of cooling by air requires seven to 10 times more um, than the, the chilled water system. So it's, uh, I've actually got a quiz question for, uh, later, so I, I won't uh, spoil that, but essentially it comes down to the, um, the heat capacity and volumetric heat transfer you know, comparison between water and air. So it just takes a lot more energy to, to move, a lot more air uh, in volume in ductwork to, to move the energy throughout the building with, with just an all air system. So we're shifting a lot of that mass flow and energy to the water side, but we still need a little bit of ductwork for your ventilation air and whatever air you need to condition your latent capacity in the space. Otherwise we could shift all that uh, other sensible space cooling energy to the water side. So one of the 
the key systems that you can combine with this type of approach would be a chill beam. Has anyone designed with a chill beam before? No? Okay. So a chill beam is traditionally defined as a sensible only device. So behind that perf, we have a horizontal coil. You can kind of see the, the connections there on, on the side that are turned up 90 degrees. So above that perf face, we have a, a water coil that's uh, you know anywhere from eight to, to 12 or 13 inches wide. And it's meant to operate as a, a dry coil. So we're controlling the water temperatures above the dew point in the space. Uh, so it's not meant to condense. There are condensing options if you were to use uh, lower water temperatures, but um, the primary air is used to treat the latent loads in the space. So really your, your DOAS equipment uh, and rooftop unit is is handling all the dehumidification for the space. So that's kind of the quick version. Even though it says chilled beam, and this is important to mention for your climate, it can do heating, even though it's called a chilled beam. That is, uh, I did not come up with that name. But yeah, typical entering water temperatures uh, would be anywhere from 90 to 120, uh, 130 degrees Fahrenheit for uh, heating with chilled beams. Again, we'll get into uh, some examples with that system in a little bit. Okay, so if we look at the generation equipment, you know, when you're looking at a traditional VAV type of system, uh, square plaque diffusers, cone diffusers that have VAV v boxes um, throughout the space, again, you're handling all of your latent capacity and sensible capacity uh, through this packaged rooftop unit in this all air type of system. But when we've got these decoupled uh, cooling systems, you know, you usually have a, a chiller and then a uh, DOAS system, um, dedicated outside air unit. And so that is ducting all of that primary air uh, to the chill beams or the sensible fan powered box into the space in those terminal devices. So, yeah, yeah. So there was some oohs and ahs that everyone missed virtually. So that's uh, pays to be in person. No, so this is showing kind of what's happening uh, in a cross section view of the chill beam. It's operating on induction. So it's kind of a, an evolution from the old induction units that we've seen, you know, kind of installed since the 1960s, 1970s. And what's happening here. What's not, I guess, shown in the render, we have some nozzles here on this uh, triangular shaped piece. And the air is being pressurized from the DOAS uh, ductwork. So the primary air, air ductwork that's being connected to this pressure vessel at the top and pushing air at high velocity through those nozzles. And what that's doing is creating a low pressure zone above that water coil. So there's no, there's no fans. Um, located at the chilled beam or typically not even, you know, slightly upstream of the beam other than the DOAS uh, equipment in the mechanical room or on the roof. Um, we're just using induction of the local room air to pull that up through the water coil. And again, that can cool or heat uh, the space through the, uh, the water coil. And the fresh air is typically coming in at about um, 55 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit in most cases. Now, yes. Right. So it's Randy, right? So Randy in the room was asking, kind of, what's the offset for the chilled water going to the chilled beam from the primary or, or the room wet bulb? Yeah. Or the primary air. Yeah. So we'll we'll do. Right. Yeah. So how do we prevent condensation of the coil and controlling water temperature based on the uh, wet bulb conditions? So we've got an example a little later on that's going to show that. 
Um, but usually it's, uh, you know, 51 degrees wet bulb or lower uh, from the primary air design is, is what we see. Um, but yeah, there's different strategies with the, the DOAS unit that can depress that moisture down to 51 uh, degrees wet bulb or even further down. Um, and you might run into that for, say, you know, classrooms, um, higher density of, of latent type spaces. But yeah, we'll show an example of that. Essentially, you want to keep the um, entering water temperature for, for the chilled water side at least two degrees above the dew point in the space. And that's typically how you would, would control that. Um, yeah. You could put condensate sensors on the uh, supply, chilled water supply going to the beam. And that's kind of reactionary. Um, you know, and that's an okay approach as well. But usually monitoring humidity in the space and controlling the resetting that chilled water temperature is is a, a good approach. Any other questions? Yeah. There's nothing moving in this. So right. what do you anticipate? The only thing that could really go wrong is the oil fails at some point, but it's not even shouldn't be seeing condensation. I suppose the nozzle here is an element like that. These beams all still in place. You know, I think of it if it was a fan coil, that fan after 12 or 15 years probably got needed to change the filter a couple of times. And uh, if it's changed, any any issues with having a replacement? For getting your, you know, I know your manufacturer and how they're done. What do you? What's the life of you? Yeah. So it's so good question. So Tom asked if um, just in comparing it with other systems, uh, chill beams versus fan coils, or you know where you've got you know more moving parts and mechanisms in the in the terminal device itself, we've been supplying chill beams into the market, price price has for um, about 15 years. And we haven't had any replacement type units because it's, you know, a lot of it is to your point, Tom, just sheet metal and the water coil, which is, you know, aluminum and copper. Um, we have water valve actuators, of course, which those have a, you know, a certain lifespan to them. Um, but yeah, really, really nothing that's gonna sort of break down and, and need replacement in them unless something was to happen catastrophically to the unit. Yep, or you change the design, yeah. They are fixed nozzles typically, um, but we do have adjustable nozzle design uh, where you can actually get up there and adjust the, the nozzle size. If, if you were to have a space change um, or if the, the business evolves or tenant changes out, you can you can adjust that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, actually to that point, um, the adjustments would be small. You know, the primary air that we're moving throughout the building, this is this is for a probably a four foot linear beam. Um, so in this example, we have 50 CFM of primary air going to the chill beam. And it's a four to one ratio. So IR induction ratio. Um, we have 50 times four. Um, parts of, so 200 CFM that's coming in through that water coil. And that's a pretty typical induction ratio, um, you know, four to one or six to one. And if you were to actually look at that for an overhead all air system design, we're moving more air with the chill beam in the space. Um, but the discharge air temperature is, is a bit warmer, you know, typically 60 degrees because you've got 55 or maybe it's a little lower coming through the primary air side, uh, but you're, you know, inducing 75 degree air up through a water coil that's got, you know, 56, 58 degrees uh, water across it. So that kind of helps with, uh, you know, comfort, inducing draft upper concerns. Uh, so I always like this comparison. If you think of it as uh, the cooling capacity in the sense of almost transfer efficiency, right? You've got BTUs per hour per CFM. Now with an all air system, 
you know, we're kind of re resorting to the uh, 1.08 uh, rho CP delta T, uh, which is 20 degrees, or sorry, 20 uh, BTUs per CFM, but with a chill beam system, again, because we're usually around uh, a fourth, uh, a quarter or a third of the airflow uh, with a, a chilled beam or a, a DOAS fan powered box system than with an all air system. So it's kind of boosting that BTUs per hour uh, per CFM that we can use to condition the space. Yeah, so they, wow, sorry about that. Should mute my, mute that. Um, in, in the wall, so in the ceiling throwing vertically or in the, yeah, we've, we've had some projects in design with, with being located in the wall and that it would work, um, technically. Yeah. So we, yeah, typically high, uh, cause you want to, you want to induce the, the air near the ceiling and then you can throw it you know, instead of downwards, maybe upwards um, and across the ceiling as much as possible to induce it. But yeah, that's not, it's not common. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say being located in the wall. We've got, there's a lot of, uh, I don't know here if you have a lot of induction units Is it, or not, not too many. Yeah. So we had, there's, there's kind of a, a revamp of those induction units uh, throughout the country, especially in the Northeast. And we have, <clears throat> excuse me, replacement units that are low level and mounted kind of in the wall. Um, you know, that's kind of the closest common application, I would say. Um, just, uh, Chris, just so you're aware, so we're not going to be breaks, you know, like 15 minutes, but if you want to, just so you know, I'm not sure. Yeah, so we probably got another 20 minutes. So let me, I think we'll get to the next section and then I'll, yeah, we'll take a quick break. All right, so three types of, oh, I should have gone to the next slide. Um, but yeah, so there's uh, really three high level types of chill beams. You've got the overhead active uh, beam, that's the linear beam, it can, come in two foot lengths up to 10 feet and uh, really any uh, one foot increment in between. And there's lots of views and, and aesthetic options on how these might look. And then the floor mounted chill beams, uh, this particular unit is a neat product because it discharges in a displacement ventilation pattern. Um, so this is the uh, active chill beam cabinet unit, um, more commonly installed in K through 12 applications. Um, Doing it in the airport. Or an airport, you're right, you're right, just up north. Um, and uh, so, yeah, for those online, yeah, we're, we're looking at a design at uh, the airport, uh, one of the airports in Wisconsin, using those beams along the perimeter. Can I ask, does the, <clears throat> the nozzle design you're using for those, does it allow the primary air pressure to be significantly lower than the old induction system? It does, yeah, exactly. So the question from Richard here was, um, is the static pressure design for these types of units that would replace induction units or the low level style, is that lower than the uh, older induction unit technology? So yeah, the static pressure typically is around 0.2 to 0.8 inches of, of water column for the any chilled beam type of unit instead of you know one to two inches, the older design. So heating through that unit would be Either fin tube, I think we're, I can't remember, Tom, we're looking at fin tube or a four pipe type of, uh, you know, one of these, I'm gonna stop going to my remember. computer. But, so six, so, yeah, six months, that's uh, equal to 10 years ago. So you could put uh, fin tube, single pass fin tube under here, uh, underneath this top discharge, or you can have the water coil be designed as a, well, two pipe, and you can do a changeover system upstream of it to provide cooling or heating um, throughout that water coil, or that could be designed as a four pipe type water coil. And then passive beams. 
which is passive in the sense it doesn't have a duct connection to it. There's no primary air uh, that's inducing uh, room air up through that, that coil. It's just a, a passive unit. So we would probably put it you know, in this room along the perimeter if you needed some supplemental cooling. Uh, it doesn't heat very well because that warm air is just going to want to stay up near that chill beam, but it can help uh, with uh, buoyancy-driven cooling. So that warm air gets up behind that passive beam, cools off, and falls down into the occupied zone. So you can mix and match that. Um, it's starting to disappear. You can mix and match those together um, to achieve the space requirements. All right, so here's the, the cutaway of that floor mounted chill beam. This is uh, Winchester High School. This is a teaching lab classroom. Um, so you can see those kind of installed throughout the perimeter. You still have those nozzles designed um, to induce the, the room air through the water coil and primary air connection through the, uh, the side. <clears throat> so passive beam. All right, so closing out this section, just a couple of case studies. This was actually, this is one of the projects that we're gonna look at a floor plan layout and talk about the design a little bit further. So we had this project located in uh, Austin, Texas, and we had four pipe, uh, two-way discharge active chill beams along the perimeter. So those did the cooling and heating uh, for the perimeter facade, and then two pipe cooling only chill beams along the interior of the space. And what they found is about 30% savings over baseline. It's a lead gold project. Um, of that 30%, the majority of it was through the fan savings. Um, so again, we were talking about shifting from an all air system, moving a smaller amount of just that primary air throughout the building can really help with reducing fan horsepower in the building. Oh, hey, Chris, we had a question. From yeah. Heidi Alverson, uh, email at the repeated. So a passive chill beam is similar to a fan coil unit with no fan. So a passive beam is similar to a fan coil unit without a fan. So it's only I, cooling, then yes. Yeah, so I would say more like the active beam is close to yeah. the fan coil um, without a fan. So we're just really operating on those uh, that induction principle and uh, inducing the room air up through the unit. So instead of the, the fan, creating the induction of the room air. We're just relying on that pressurized uh, plenum inside of the chill beam to push that air. Okay, nope, thank you for the question. And then uh, this is a project in Iowa that uh, was also lead gold. This was a historic building. So it was kind of interesting project with the, the renovation and not being able to, um, I'll say modify the facade much um, due to it being historic. Um, so that's one of the key things with, with chill beams. Either it's a, a new construction project where you can design the facade to be uh, tight um, because uh, concerns would be moisture infiltration. So if you have, say, a lobby area, um, atrium areas, you know that might be a different system that can handle condensation and then the rest of the building that doesn't have that um, revolving door open to the exterior. Um, you could use the chilled beam products, but for a historic renovation, you know, definitely making sure if you're looking at a project like that, that you've got a sufficiently uh, sealed facade and perimeter system. So that way you can help control and mitigate the moisture infiltration. So again, they saw about uh, just over 30% energy savings over the baseline. So similar to the previous project. Okay, this is the last uh, sections, I promise. Then we'll take a quick break. So chilled beams were evaluated for Johns Hopkins University, or sorry, Johns Hopkins Hospital. And what they found on the, on the left side in their analysis, you could see that's the all air system. So you've got a supply duct uh, and then the uh, recirculation duct and exhaust. So you've got three sections of ductwork represented in this left rendering. And then the right rendering, they evaluated uh, comparing it with chilled beam systems. So with the chilled beam system, obviously we only have the supply uh, and then the, uh, the exhaust um, because recirculation is all hap happening locally, in this case within the patient rooms and the corridors. Um, so it really reduced the 
uh, sheet metal and infrastructure quite substantially. So this was their typical um, approach with uh, the all air system. And you can see that they've got the mechanical room in the, uh, the Northeast section here. And then when we switched, they looked at the chill beam system, it substantially reduced the duct work and allowed them to add another patient room uh, for that, that branch of uh, the patient ward. So in, in hospitals, and, and you can't use chill beams uh, throughout, obviously, you know, operating suites and, and those sort of areas, um, ICUs, um, is typically not allowed. But for acute care patient rooms, you can use just the two air changes of your primary air that's supplied to the chill beam, and then two or four air, additional air changes of that, the total air changes required in the space could be used for that recirculation uh, through the chill beam. So per ASHRAE 170, um, as long as you're- We have a really nice install of Europe. That's right, yep. And I think we're gonna have a couple of, of slides showing the, the Appleton Hospital oh, okay. project. Um, yep, good point. Um, so yeah, that's, that's opportunities. You don't need filters, uh, typically, if you're operating it as a dry coil. Um, so that is something that's in the main uh, ASHRAE 170 standard. All right, and then a um, lot of, oops, I was about to say a lot of information, then I just skip it. Um, so financially, you know, the, the hospitals um, can earn up to, I think, even in some cases I've heard recently, uh, the, the revenue is about 2000 dollars per square foot uh, per year. So obviously adding another patient room is, is crucial um, in expanding the finances and creating growth for those hospital systems. Um, so they found that uh, in their analysis, the chill beams really helped to, uh, to accommodate that. They actually found a mechanical system savings of over half a million with the install. So again, we were talking a little bit earlier uh, before this started, you know, they, depending on the type of system and application you're comparing it to, there might be a slight premium to it, or there could be some savings depending on, you know, again, what we're considering as, as baseline. All right, then the last one uh, is really just those benefits. So energy savings, do stock work, we won't, uh, we've talked about those um, in, in detail. Uh, maintenance, lower noise. So this, this was at uh, Oracle Waterfront Project, and they actually went in and added a white noise system after the fact, just because the chill beam system was was quieter. So even though we have uh, the high velocity being injected in the space through those nozzles, it's a very low amount of air that we're moving throughout the space. So they tend to be very quiet uh, type of systems. All right. So with that, see how we doing on time. So we're four minutes till 10. So we'll take what, 10 minute break. All right. All right, and then we'll come back and we'll we'll close this one out. Your uh, attendance is growing. You started off at thirty, and now you're thirty-five on the call. So nice. Word out. <laughs> so hey, mine have started. It's a lot of He's old. Oh, we're talking about the Yeah. Going to my computer to change the slides. Yeah, it worked. Yeah. Are you not doing a change system? No, I I I do so much work for right. for variety. It's all server stuff. And it's yeah, it's almost getting you're not putting any water. Getting boring. I mean. Where's the point? I mean, it's, it's from good. an energy standpoint, it's kind of interesting what you're doing, but you know, not even using a raised floor anymore. It's just throwing pretty high temperature supply or two large drills, hot aisles, or some of those things. Plug in 70, 60 degrees, supply air, you know, and then looks like Michael's handling this. This is good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah.
that it's dry cooler. No, it's actually a pump for certain they turn it certain the outside air temperature gets low enough. Uh -huh. The breath is shut off and then uh, pumps actually just circulate the with the refrigerant. Really? Yeah. 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 Like so you, the like pump pipe. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, that's the thing. There's really no place to like with all that heat. There's really nowhere to throw with full of waste. That is kind of interesting, but so no, I have not. I have not personally been able to do that. Children. Yeah, it's interesting. So I saw your comments, but they are very spot. So yeah, I feel like it's I feel like they're about the only point in the state. Well, let's see, she has done a job, maybe. Okay. Um, and then someone else I think done might have been someone did FC Johnson. Ray has never done one. I don't know. Maybe you guys have done one in Illinois and there's nothing here. Right. Yeah, a lot of the a lot of the projects we do just don't lend themselves to it. You get a feel for, I mean, when is are too many people afraid of the uh, what if I what if we get that coil below the oh uh, my gosh, yeah, the big fear that keeps people going. Um, there was a we did the, the CRC back in 2000 something, uh, it was um. Tim Bauer from Butters had done at the Paraguay University of Chemical Design Bill at the Lake Washington City. And they had, they had whittled the cost out of the, the ad, which was a chases and ceiling and said, stuff for it. And they had pretty much got you in the for the conventional air handling system. Most people do not have to drive to you know, make design a challenging system and then crude in case. So in this particular case, and it, who knows, maybe it was kind of biased people who just like, go out of your way to find every nickel that you can dig out from under the couch. But, right. um, but he made a pretty good case. So yeah, so I, I was in. Oh. I was the technical chair for that community, so they had 10 weeks speaking. It was pretty good. And we had Lula in, so that was pretty good. He was the architect of the Lula and his, he was a Phil S. Payne, but the guy. He's just an iteration of that. Right. So, he's good. Yeah. 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 Do they want to live with you know the these change jobs or air handling change jobs versus we're gonna put the full space down through the sun and be able to sit on that side because that's what our project there is about to be a client. So we can probably say that all that you're in the kind of got all this all the infrastructure you need to run the system. Can you make your area a little more efficient? Yeah. You know, you pick that, then you're looking at your Point. Yeah, once the building has been passed as a air distribution building, and then not a product that I just don't see it. I mean, it does suck to you getting coops all that damage. There's no there's no kidding around it. When it's already there, it's really, really hard to just get me just all it. So I've got a study that I've been sleeping. It doesn't have to hold a very long study. 
a lot of memes because they're working with owners that want 50 year designs and then they're willing to do like if you're willing to buy a 50 year treasury bond if you're willing to buy you're willing to go to bridgewater and you know, that kind of investing strategy with your moment if you're looking at like 100 years out yeah yeah you can just buy all you want but most can i do that here like you know they're obviously the president for our new construction that is sweet yeah, that's not yeah. So right, yeah. Even if I wanted to go to beams here, I mean, just put in a room. It's four hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. Now I got to do windows. I have no idea what that's. Like. But this building is extremely. Yes. Oh, um, she got a little Yeah, it's a uh, no, it's um, and uh, it's not like a bunch of it's a Russian. Uh, not in the business leadership anymore, and we dissolve. Um, although we are getting together, uh, but uh, what she does are employee interview testing. Okay, so someone. They get to the first interview. The best, pretty kind of nice. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. I was just talking about the interview. I was just talking about the interview. I don't know. Yeah. Dinner. Good day for having me to the dinner with the spouse of the candidate. Hey, we should start. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can start whenever you want, but we're still on, right? Mm -hmm. We're still recording. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything looks good. Can you hear me okay still from the, from the audience? Uh, Anybody, uh, I guess I'm going to come to you. Hey, folks, we're going to get started again. If anybody's having any technical difficulties, you want to all good remotely. Thank you, Ben Patterson. All right, we are going to get started. All right. Sounds good. So the next uh, part of this presentation, we're going to be going through some specific considerations with these, these technologies and how the systems can, can work together. Uh, so going right into, Randy, your question earlier. So when it, we look at the humidity control in the space, it is uh, gonna be a little different, not the ultimate uh, target, but really how we're gonna condition that primary air uh, to handle the, the latent in the space. Because now we've got you know the benefit with the uh, decoupled cooling system is less airflow going to the space, but that's also something we have to design for in the primary air and dew point design of that primary airflow. Um, Cause now we're dealing with, you know, a third of the airflow. So assuming 
some basic generic uh, room conditions. We've got 75 degrees set point at 50%. Um, but now we need, you could see that uh, for an all air system, the latent capacity per CFM is just under two BTUs uh, per hour per CFM. So, and that's what the typical 55, 54 degree uh, wet bulb type of uh, system design. Now with the decoupled cooling, uh, we have to depress that moisture a, a little bit further to again, account for that ultimately the room side uh, humidity condition. So in this case, we, for this application, we've got 55, 51 degree, um, and the latent capacity has uh, more than more than tripled. So we've got 9.93 BTUs per hour per CFM, and the dew point of that primary is 49 degrees. So again, the intent here is that we depress the moisture further in the primary air, so that way we can achieve the same uh, desired relative humidity in the space and dew point um, in the space ultimately. Now, the primary airflow per occupant, of course, that changes uh, based on the application, right? So you've got different latent loads that are generated per occupant, uh, whether you're dealing with a classroom or a gymnasium, and then there's a minimum ventilation uh, per occupant. This is going to drive the, the dew point variation, right? So, and some of these are not necessarily realistic, you know, 36 um, degrees dew point, uh, 28 degrees dew point is, is very low. So there's, there's always a balance in terms of what is the minimum ventilation rate and your primary airflow rate. So you might choose an air handler um, or a DOAS unit that provides 44 or 45 degree dew point, um, but you're, you're supplying a little more primary airflow into the space. Um, so that's kind of the balance that you have to make on a, on a project by project case. So it's a balance between equipment capabilities and also um, the amount of primary airflow that we need to the space. So all of that can be done uh, from a, the room side perspective design through a selection software pretty easily. So you can optimize your primary airflow um, within those selection softwares that are available. So it kind of makes the, the job a, a little bit easier. Um, in fact, here's a, a cutaway or a, a snip from the selection software. So this is uh, one example showing all the inputs. So these are the input parameters that you uh, might put into or see, at least these are the default ones. So we've got 75 degree design uh, dry bulb for cooling, 72 degree set point in the space for heating. Uh, let's see what else. NC requirements. Um, threshold being 35 NC, um, room attenuation, we don't typically change that. And then this is the primary air conditions uh, you can change. So if you've got 55 degree dry bulb, um, you can change around with the relative humidity. You know, standard is, is 80 degrees. Again, that's that 51.6 degree wet bulb or 49 degree dew point. Um, so again, this is kind of a default what it looks like for the inputs. Um, and then you can, we won't have time uh, today to go through any selection software, um, but essentially you could copy in your loads for your spaces for each of the zones, and then um, either auto select or manually select, you know, chill beams for those, that particular zone. So this is showing, you can kind of see it, a little bit of a pink shade to it. You can, uh, the software is going to highlight which zones that you need to look at, what might be subpar from what the requirements are in the space. So you can go in there and either increase the, the quantities of the beams, which is right here, um, or change the, the models or the piping strategy or length of beams. So all that is kind of uh, built into these, these softwares to help with the selection process. I think displacements are harder. This is the load to load. Systems are harder. Well, this is the load to load. Yeah. 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 You should have your go as you selected for late. So you're just solving for sensible and space, right? Not much. Right. Being laid out. Yeah. It sounds hard, but it's just the load to load. 
when we do displacement, it's a little trickier. And you're getting rid of some of the load. Right. And here, just like not much different than the AD and the users. Yeah, or fan box uh, selection fan, anyway. Fan coil. Yeah, so for those online, just Tom was commenting that, you know, the, the load's the load. This is a pretty simple selection process. I, there's a lot of, you know, content on the slide, but, you know, we just need to make modifications um, to, to achieve the load, and then we're good to go. Um, it's, it's different than a, you know, say displacement ventilation type strategy where you're actually modifying at least the factors and uh, the amount of load that we're, we're looking at to condition the, the space. Uh, so a little bit simpler in that, in that sense. All right, so if you wanted to do it manually, like I said, you can change all those, uh, we'll call it tan uh, cells that are shaded in, or you can optimize it. So again, you can reduce, optimize for quantity, reduce the number of beams that you have in the space. Uh, you can optimize it for primary air. So if you wanna bring down the amount of uh, primary air CFM total for the building, you can select that one and just hit auto select. You can allow the program to adjust the length. So this is uh, free to download on the price website. So definitely if you have a, a project that's coming up, this is very useful uh, to use. And of course, if you have any questions, reach out to you know Tom or myself. We're happy to help. So some high level water side considerations. Again, we talked about on the cooling side being above your dew point in the space, and that is typically around two degrees above the dew point in the space. That's kind of industry wide what we hear. Um, we'll say even that is, uh, you know, it's it's conservative. You know. Condensation takes a while to form, but also you've got airflow across the water coil. It's not like a radiant uh, chilled surface that doesn't have any air movement or it's kind of stagnant across the, the radiant surface. Um, but that's the, uh, the, uh, the offset. Water side delta T is typically five, six degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and just suggesting not below 0.5 GPMs, um, really for the sake of getting into laminar flow, just making sure with that half inch uh, too, we don't get uh, any slow moving water velocity through it. We optimize the turbulence. Uh, for heating again, uh, 90 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So kind of right in line with, with those heat pump uh, technologies we talked about earlier. Um, now on the heating side, you're still able to get that, you know, up to 20 degrees Fahrenheit Delta across the, the system. Same GPMs, uh, 0.5 to three GPMs is kind of typical. And then the water side. So I think I've got a couple points here. There's a number of ways that we can achieve the elevated uh, chilled water supply in the, in the system. And it kind of depends on each project. If you've got a large uh, you know, campus uh, chiller facility that uh, say for a hospital or a university, um, you can pull off of that chiller plant and use different strategies like a, a mixing valve or a plate and frame heat exchanger to tie into the uh, 42 degree water that might be going to the DOAS or running to the uh, fan cool units that are in the entrance areas. So as I mentioned, if you have any areas where you might have a lot of moisture gain into the space uh, that's you know frequent or uncontrolled, you can still use um, low temp devices with drain pans um, in those areas, and then supplement the other areas, offices with uh, chilled beams. So this one here is showing uh, two different uh, chillers. So you got a low temp chiller and a medium temp chiller. So this would be say for, you know, a sizable project, 100,000, 200,000 square foot space where you, you know, financially are justifying, um, you know, two different chillers for the space. Uh, so this is showing dedicated chillers for that. Again, district loops. Um, oh, sorry, thought I had one more. Um, any questions on that? So we'll oh, we've got a couple slides in the next section. We'll go into each of those different strategies and kind of what that looks like specifically. All right, so let's get into a couple of applications. Uh, so we're going to go through this was hey, that. Hey, Chris, uh, we do have one. We've okay. got a, a chat question that came through. 
see if I can find it on the screen here. Uh, just about software. You can just download the site and program now. I'll put a, you know what, I'll just tell them I'll put the link in there. Okay. Yeah, we'll. The software. Yeah, so John, we see your question there. We're going to send you the link for the uh, selection software. You can you can download that, preferably not during the presentation, but you know, you're know you free to do that. Uh, so yeah, we're going to look at the, this uh, example here. So we've got the same default space parameters, uh, 75, 72. Uh, we keep the primary air conditions the same. We've got 55 degree primary air at 80% coming in. And entering water, so here we've got 57 degrees for cooling and 105 degrees for heating. Um, these are, again, snips from the selection software. Just uh, paste it in over top the, the layout. So here's the requirements. We've got, uh, I think this is the one we're going to look at first. So we've got the open office area up here in the, the top uh, left, and then the perimeter. So we've got them broken out in different zones, and this is kind of how you would treat if you have a large open space with a perimeter. You would break it up into two zones per the software. Small detail there, but just um, pointing that out. It helps select with different models or maybe a different selection. Uh, and then we've got our latent and sensible loads. And of course, the heating load added in for the perimeter. Just curious, what? What is like for new construction a typical BTUs per linear feet for heating? Is that something that anyone keeps kind of in the front of their, their head? Are you, you at like 40, 400 BTUs per linear feet or? We don't think of it that way, kind of. Every job is different, okay. I know that when we use electric, we started 250. 250. BTUs? Perfect. Okay. The four foot heater is like one kilowatt. Yeah, times three yeah. point. Three point something. Seven, seven, yep. Seven. Yep. Okay. okay. Yeah. So seven hundred. I mean, I, I know there's better envelopes. Right. Yeah, just wondering, I, you know, it helps me to, to think about BTUs per foot, you know, what the requirement is and see if these are in line with what with what you're seeing. Yeah. <clears throat> so the open office is just over 1,600 square feet, uh, 19 BTUs per square foot for cooling. And then for the perimeter, we were switching to linear feet requirements. So for heating, we're about 308 BTUs per linear feet. Um, so both of the units, let's see. Oh, this is, okay. So this is just showing a representation of it. It's not the project that we're designing here. So different project. Um, I think that's a pretty high load there for Texas. But just showing you the, the two-way discharge at the perimeter um, is an effective way of, of doing that. You can also design these to be one way, but if you wanted them to look consistent for the interior chilled beams. Um, so for heating, that might be a, a good approach where you've got uh, the interior discharge slot blanked off, and then you're just providing the air uh, towards the perimeter in this case. Uh, so everything is selected for that two-way, which is the, the unit that's shown on the screen. And we've got, let's see, seven, seven beams for the open office and seven for the perimeter that are running in parallel with each other. Um, let's see, anything else to note here? So we are hitting all the loads. We've got about a little over, well, 1.1 GPM uh, per chilled beam in the case of the open office. A little bit higher for the perimeter. We've got uh, um, more more cooling there, densely. And then four point nine, so kind of low on the on the uh, the hot water, but not quite at 0.5 GPMs. Uh, six foot beams. So this one here is selected with a four pipe uh, water coil at the perimeter. So with a four pipe chilled beam, 
um, you actually have uh, dedicated circuits for heating and cooling. So there's about 25% of the water coil is dedicated to heating when you have a four pipe uh, chilled beam. So just keep that in mind if you, if you are doing a four pipe style unit, that's gonna derate your cooling opportunity a little bit just because you've got a little less uh, circuitry dedicated for the cooling chilled water loop. Uh, let's see, the software can also output throws. So you can double check your throw uh, and discharge pattern and kind of space the, the chilled beams effectively, um, which can be pretty helpful to make sure you're not having any collisions, just like any other um, type of air system. This idea will be, for the, since you, this room has, from what I can see, two, uh, two exterior walls, correct? And that, so it's the wall on the left. Also. Right, right. So would, would you probably, I'm assuming if there's a beam right below that's covered by that text box below your cursor. Yes. You probably throw that into the cursor also. Yeah. To your point, washing the, the windows here on the left. Yeah. Right. I guess I would also put how sensitive are the windows on the left when it's between the Carolina glass. It's like a 20% reduction. 3499 versus 2433. Cooling. In the cooling mode, unless it's like north facing. What's, uh, sorry, I'm still catching up. So, so we'll put so, all this yeah. cooling zone, even though it's probably the same area. Has a, a uh, open office has a greater sensible cooling load than the perimeter. And I'm just challenging that with the amount of glass or the amount of. I have a feeling that the picture in that example. No. Yeah, the open office is a bigger square footage. Yeah, yeah that would the be perimeter. Square footage. Yeah. The number of people in it. So, this is a built in quiz, and you guys have passed. So, thank you very much. There'll be more trapdoors and Chris's presentation going forward. So far. Yeah. Yeah, and I would I would say if you have a lot of heating, so you've got these two facades here, um, rotating that or putting um, a recessed unit with a, a discharge, vertical discharge at the perimeter too. If you if you, you could put a soffit in there, a couple different options, but definitely uh, making sure that we're discharging towards the glass. Yeah, that's a good point. One thing I, I uh, shared that it's nice that Bryce makes beams because they are also an air distribution company. So, you know, having a lab that does sound and being able to actually measure throw without guessing and having all that data included in the software is a little bit of a luxury compared to some of the companies that just make a box, shove a coil in, put some nozzles on it, the way right. they go. Yeah. Um, so last thing to note, we've got a VAV box here supplying to all these beams. That's a pretty common approach um, just to, to control your airflow um, and primary air to the space. Um, now you're going to handle your space temperature control typically through that water valve um, to the chilled beams, but this can control your, uh, whether it's demand control ventilation or just controlling the, the primary airflow to the, to the space or balancing it and then trimming dampers at each beam for balancing. All right, and then here's another one. Um, we'll go quickly through this one just for the sake of time, uh, but private office, we've got, uh, oh, make sure we can see that uh, in the room here. So for private office, we've got a two-way single unit uh, six foot in length, and I would even suggest a four-way type of, of chill beam. So it's the model is ACBM, but it's got a four-way discharge to kind of shorten the, the throw compared to the two-way. So that helps with really uh, small rooms um, or it's a focus room here um, to, to prevent drafts. <clears throat> uh, and then conference room, got uh, four pipe system because this is also along the, the perimeter facade. All right. 
Uh, next up is the sensible cooling fan powered terminal unit. I know it's a, it's a mouthful. Has anyone seen the fan powered? It, it could be referred to as a DOAS fan box. Have you seen this before? Yeah, okay. Couple in the room. <laughs> right. Uh, so this is starting to become a common option. It's, uh, it's kind of a, a chill beam just with a, a fan integrated into it. So it gives you a couple of extra control points and, and tighter control of a couple things here. Um, helps with turn down. So if you have a space, if you have a chill beam project laid out or but you've got a conference room or somewhere where you have a pretty high amount of turn down ratio that you need to, uh, to account for, this is a good approach because the fan obviously allows us to have a, a very high turn down 10 to one in most cases. Uh, so the air valve <clears throat> maintains the flow of ventilation air and controls the, the latent load uh, into the space. You can kind of see there's a cross flow sensor in there for measuring the airflow, the CFM into the box and space. And then there's a large uh, cooling coil. Uh, can't have a heating coil as well, but typically sensible cooling coil on the return section to condition the space. Um, air that's being recirculated into that box. So it's typically dry, but you can put a, a drip tray in there as well, just for um, peace of mind. And then an ECM fan, of course. You can't really see this. I know, Tom, you pointed this out, but there's droplets on there. That's just what the X means, like no condensation. A uh, check mark is good. Um, Next up is uh, an underfloor air system. So I, I don't know that it's a common approach here in, uh, in Wisconsin or where you, you typically are designing for, but underfloor air, you can also make a, a decoupled cooling system. Uh, so this is the vertical fan column. Uh, this is showing like a small mechanical closet. Uh, these are typically anywhere from six feet by six feet to eight feet by eight feet in size. And it's just, just charging downwards into that underfloor air plenum and pulling room air through these return grills that might have silencers or attenuators because um, it's just small mechanical closet open to the, uh, the office. And that's pulling in bypass airflow and conditioning some of that return airflow through a chilled water coil. Um, and again, that's typically seeing 56, 57 degree uh, chilled water to that water coil. So for the most part, it's handling your sensible load in the space, but it can and does come with uh, drain pans. Yeah. If you wanted to. Basically, seeing what was the size of the figure. Yeah. And yeah. So this will do any. Yeah. So <clears throat> comment from the room just that you know this is very similar to the previous slide, uh, just bigger, bigger fan unit. Um, now. The interesting thing with this approach is that, uh, and I don't know, is anyone familiar with underfloor air distribution? Kind of the, the concept there. So we're using a raised access floor system, typically two foot by two foot grid um, on pedestals, and you're pressurizing that underfloor plenum. Now with a fan column, you're putting these fan columns that can do anywhere from 3000 CFM to 20,000 CFM a unit, kind of evenly throughout uh, quadrants in the space. And that gets the air delivery very close to the perimeter. Like you want it because you've got uh, thermal decay into that underfloor plenum um, that uh, you want to put those air injection points as close to those furthest uh, perimeter spaces. What this does is allow the uh, ductwork to be significantly reduced, if not removed, uh, underneath the floor plenum. So that really helps with um, really all, all um, all aspects, you know, reducing costs, but also, you know, future flexibility with, with removing ductwork under here. But that also allows us to shrink the uh, plenum heights. You know, so in the past, um, and I know casinos, you know, typically they're 24 inches minimum, but for commercial office spaces, usually we're in the 12 inch tall raised access floor height. But, you know, with fan columns reducing ductwork, because that's usually the limiting factor, we can get down to eight. Uh, or 10 inches raised access floor. Um, we've actually even seen that approach applied to a renovation 
of a building that didn't have raised access floor before. Um, so eight inch raised access floor keeps your ramps at the elevators, uh, bathrooms and stairwells to eight feet in length. So for uh, underfloor or displacement ventilation uh, in general is one of the abilities is to reduce your, your outside air volume uh, going to the space. So for these decoupled systems, that, that could directly impact the size of your DOAS equipment um, by this percentage. So this is taken from, I don't have a reference on here, uh, ASHRAE 62.1, the zone air distribution effectiveness area, where when you're calculating your uh, volume of outside air required to the breathing zone in the space, you can divide that by these E sub Zs factors, your zone air distribution effectiveness. So instead of a overhead a traditional system where you're uniformly mixed from the ceiling, um, you know, which is at best 1.0, unless you're, you're dumping, which we don't want to do, um, <clears throat> you can divide it by uh, 1.2 or 1.5. Um, which could be pretty substantial um, size and energy savings. The uh, in terms of when they implemented this. Yeah. Like it's it's been in there since 2010 yeah yeah right yeah and then the the more recent one i can't remember which year it is um 2019 or 2022 they implemented this 1.5 uh e sub z and just I know it's pretty small font for those in the back. Um, everybody looks pretty young in the back, so I'm sure they can see it. Uh, 18 feet above the finished floor. So if you're able to put your returns 18 feet above where you're supplying, you can use the 1.5 ventilation effect. So could be substantial if you think of places like atriums, you know, actually where displacement is a, a great fit is uh, tall spaces, lots of glass atriums, maybe where you don't have a lot of, you know, ventilation rate requirement because, you know, low occupant density. Because um, obviously, otherwise, your primary is driven by your, your latent capacity. But yeah, good thing to, to point out. Um, okay, so that for this uh, layout of this project, we've got um, a pretty sim simple design. Um, and that's kind of the beauty with underfloor is You've got, you know, a thousand, two thousand diffusers that are just evenly placed um, throughout the building. There's not di different uh, discharge patterns, one way, two way, um, or collisions that we necessarily have to worry about. Uh, it's just place them in each cubicle in this case. Um, and these, this particular project was all automated, but I would say eighty percent of the projects we see are manual room side adjustable diffusers. Um, very economical way to give each occupant control of their airflow. Also helps with lead um, opportunities. And the perimeter are just decoupled linear uh, trough units. And so the, let's see the, yeah, so the number on here is just the CFM uh, per unit. And then towards the core of the building, we've got a mechanical space for the air tower unit near, near the, uh, the risers. So really, you want to keep like a 50-foot rule. Uh, if you don't want any duct work, you need the supply points to be within 50 feet of uh, you know, the furthest space. Um, when looking at these air towers, uh, this is assuming <clears throat> these assumptions here on the left, entering water temperature of 55. This is the, the CFMs and the BTUs, or MBHs, sorry, um, per unit on that coil. And the, the coil options range from two to six rows. There's, there's several different uh, configurations there. Uh, the main thing here is we can go from 2,500 CFM up to uh, 17,500 uh, CFM. So if you think of one CFM per square foot, it's pretty big square footage. <clears throat> All 
All right, so for, for this project, what we selected was um, LFT units, and that will make sense uh, in a little bit. That's the linear fan terminal unit. Uh, we had three units piped in parallel because when you use a tangential fan inside of these trench uh, heating cooling systems, you actually get quite a bit of, of BTUs per, per foot. So this is something that uh, Airflow had posted in the blog um, a little while ago talking about this class is that there's different opportunities, whether you're mounting these uh, trough systems flush to the floor, maybe it's a dugout concrete trench or above floor, you can put them in sheet metal enclosures that are uh, finished to suit the aesthetics in the space. Um, but with very little airflow, and again, this is from the room side um, because this is just recirculating room air in through that water coil. Um, you can achieve up to almost two MBHs per foot. And this is with, yeah, 135 degrees um, entering water. So still within that uh, typical heat pump operation. Now, the reason it's parallel, we are getting leaving fluid temperatures of over 20 degrees. So, you know, that second unit piped in series wouldn't really be outputting much. Um, so we'll just have a uh, parallel series configuration. Um, one GPM, so this isn't pushing it to the two or three GPM max. Um, so there's a little bit more room there. On the cooling side, uh, less MBH per foot, but we're about 570 MBH per foot for this unit um, using 55 degree interim water. So what is this LFT we're talking about? There's a number of units that if you have a raised access floor, pressurized plenum, uh, that can provide heating and cooling to the space. These are the two options on the left. Um, so this unit provides air up through the bottom of this uh, through a full face uh, water coil. Um, and that can do uh, these specs here. It's a little bit taller, about 11 inches with the damper fully open. Uh, and then this is the uh, linear heating cooling uh, floor beam that I referenced earlier in the, the New York project at 50 Hudson Yards. So this can do cooling and heating. You can see there's quite a few rows associated with this unit um, and then a drain pan, stainless steel drain pan under the, the water coil to capture any condensation. Um, so heat output at 105, really for all these units are, are pretty similar. If you don't have that pressurized air plenum and uh, the air tower or the rooftop units doing all the, the push of the air into the, uh, the perimeter, you can utilize the linear fan terminal, whether it's raised access floor or just a, a standard job without an underfloor plenum, you can use this unit. So you can kind of see here, we've got the linear fan terminal um, or tangential fan down inside of this unit. Um, now the height is really low profile. So it could be four inches tall um, and can do heating and cooling even within a four inch tall cabinet. And that includes the grill depth as well, which isn't shown here um, on the picture. Um, yeah, so that fan kicks on, the, uh, the air from the room side is just being pulled in through that fan and pushed out through that coil up the, uh, the perimeter facade there. Uh, no, the, the widest unit, which is our four-row, four-pipe unit, uh, is about 11 inches wide. 
the, there's a unit with electric resistance heat that's seven inches wide. And then the two row unit is eight inches wide. So lots of different options there. The question from uh, in the room here was just what's the width of the, the linear fan terminal unit on the right. Center on the right hand side. Uh, these two here? Yeah. Yeah, so there's um, there for the fan, there's a so the well, let me repeat the question. So just in terms of um, earlier conversations on filter change out for fan coils, um, what does that maintenance um, and filter change out, if any, look like on these trough units? Um, so there's there's really not it much uh, well, there's no filters associated with these particular units. Um, you know, any, the, the grills are removable so that you could vacuum those out if there was any uh, particulates that fell down and small enough to fall through the linear grill. Um, I guess I always thought we'd use some of the contaminants into a peak space. And that's what gets caught in the filter that's sent to a safe, sent to the ocean air handling. Uh, I would think these would catch some of that same stuff on the intake though. Yeah, usually, um, a lot. Of, I don't want to go on record saying anything from uh, like a, on a virus sort of level, but yeah, any anything that small bacteria, you know, would flow through the coil, you know, and probably not get caught on the coil because it's not a, a wet coil. Um, but if you had anything that particulates that were to collect, I know lint is one thing. So for hospitals, you have a high amount of lint uh, unique to that space, which requires you know some occasional you know, cleaning of the, the unit, which the, for a chill beam, speaking of that unit, there's pin latches in the face. You can drop that down and clean it from the room side. Yeah. Um, we did have that. Good questions, though. Any anything else? They were pretty good on it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the you know the hope would be that we're uh, thirty percent or even fifty percent over what you need for the the perimeter conditioning. That way you can space them fifty percent. Uh, usually for especially northern climate like this, I wouldn't suggest going beyond. 50% uh, inactive, um, you know, just so you don't have any dead spots uh, to condition the perimeter. All right, so in summary, um, you know, again, that inverse relationship of lower uh, lift means higher system efficiency. There's lots of different uh, systems and the end device uh, components, terminal units that can really help us uh, achieve a, a solid system with, with heat pumps or, you know, these uh, more temperate entering water conditions. So just some reminders here, you know, up to 30% heating plant efficiency when using 105 instead of 140. Again, that's referencing the ASHRAE 90.1 chart. Um, pretty similar uh, plant efficiency increases. We're going from 42 to 55 enter water on the cooling side. Um, decoupling. It also helps us, we didn't really talk about this, but obviously giving us tight control of humidity in the space and how much airflow 
is being supplied um, into each individual space. Um, it's not a, just a percentage of the total airflow in a combined all air system um, being supplied. And we'll actually talk in the next section about that in a little more detail. All right, and then, uh, yeah, maybe consider stratification. I know that, I don't know if displacement ventilation or underfloor is something that you've, uh, you've worked with before, but you know, it could be quite possible to combine our sensible fan box with displacement ventilation. You know, there's different strategies to, to, uh, to create a stratified environment, get the indoor air quality benefits with that, um, and help with, with saving on the, even the equipment side um, by reducing that outside air requirement to the space. All right, so that, that closes up the first hour, not so hour. Um, yeah, two hours. So right, we'll take a break until uh, right at 11, and uh, we'll be back. It sounds good. Okay. So we'll take another break, and uh, we'll be back at 11. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Hopefully everyone's with us on the virtual attendees. So next section, I'm going to be uh, just finishing up uh, the discussion on fan powered DOAS box equipment uh, and some little bit of selection and details on those units. And then also uh, combining it with chilled beams. We actually had a project where um, we got to work with the engineer and architect combining those two systems um, and utilizing them on the same project. They provided unique benefits. I won't, I won't get into too much detail here um, ahead of the slides, but it was, it was quite, quite a good experience um, to work through them with that project. Um, so that'll be 20 minutes, and then I will hand it off to Mr. Tom Jolene to talk about the next um, topic for combined um, heat and power and a couple other items. So with that, let's get right into it. So system design considerations for a uh, fan-powered DOAS box, we'll call it, is very similar upstream of the unit compared to a chill beam system. Um, so it just gives you that added uh, comfort and you know, familiarity with the fan powered box. So you've got that control of the airflow um, directly with the fan powered units. It also gives you better turn down than the chill beams. So chill beams um, can typically have a ratio of cutting it down to about 50% of the airflow, but below that we just don't want to lose induction through that chill, the, the coil face. So usually below 0.2 inches of water column, that start, we start to see some degradation of the induction through the chill beam. So if you have a couple of spots of needing to control humidity or the, uh, the turn down ratio a little bit more than the chill beam, what that's gonna offer you, uh, this is a, a great solution. So like I said, the primary air conditions are very similar to, uh, to a chill beam and the air volume for the primary air side is the same as the, the chill beams. And again, so that's why we can use those um, you know, interchangeably throughout, the, throughout a project. Um, so here we've got, uh, let's see, our DOAS unit in sort of the north uh, corner of, of the building, and then our uh, chiller um, on this side here. Um, so the, again, primary air from the DOAS running throughout the secondary and tertiary uh, ductwork to the fan powered box and um, very similar water conditions as the chill beam approach. So here's some specs on the turn down capabilities. So you could see that, oh, it was actually on the lower side was the 10 to one and goes even up to 24 to one um, turn down was this, which is pretty substantial. So really good opportunity there. Um, again, if you, if you run into that, uh, that situation there. So the units can go from uh, 400 up to 2,600 um, CFM. So quite a bit more airflow as well. We're talking about with uh, the fan powered box compared to the chilled beam type approach. Um, but a uh, little bit higher casing. So chilled beam is usually uh, nine to 10 inches in, in height. Um, the low profile DOAS box, which is on the left was designed um, out of the necessity to keep uh, plenum heights low. So the Washington DC market, uh, if you're familiar with that market at all, there's, there's pretty uh, restrictive on the, uh, the ceiling heights and, and also the building heights. Um, so I think they're usually working with about nine feet um, 
you know, clear space, uh, not included in the ceiling. So that was developed with the, the low profile design to get the casing within 11 inches. And max MBH is about 27 MBH for sensible cooling capacity. And if you can go with the standard height, uh, which you know ranges from 18 to about 20, uh, just over 20 inches in height, that can give you 36 MBHs of, of cooling capacity. So to put it in perspective, a chilled beam typically supplies around one MBH per foot, one to 1.2 MBH per foot. So just keeping that in mind, now it's not a, it's not a direct uh, swap. Like you wouldn't be able to change out 36 linear feet of beams with a fan powered box necessarily, because that is the largest size max CFM NC, probably around 50 sort of situation. Like that's the max um, that can it do. And also you've got your space you know, requirements when you get down into the individual um, zone loads, but that's, uh, that's kind of the peak capabilities with it. Uh, for heating, uh, which again, important for us here in Wisconsin, you can put the discharge reheat at the, sorry, the hot water coil at the discharge for reheat. Um, and then you can also do an electric coil design. So again, this is really common in the DC market. Um, electric coil heat, um, quite a bit easier. And also the air pressure drop is, is much lower than adding additional rows for heating on the hydronic side. Um, and then you can also put the hot water coil on the return as well. So that'll open it up, bigger coil, less air pressure drop, a uh, little bit more efficient, and you can just heat the uh, return air um, into the space. So lots of options there. Benefit of, is electric heat, reheat pretty common? Not here. Not here? Okay. Yeah. So electric heat, TBD, to be uh, determined uh, how much you start to see in the market, but that's not an option with, with chilled beams. Um, all right, so next additional benefits, um, higher humidity applications, of course, we've got the, uh, uh, due to the variation and very variability of the primary airflow, uh, that can really help with those um, aspects of it. You could put a cross flow sensor on that damper which allows us to do demand control ventilation. I know there's a couple of different ways in which that could be achieved, but um, if you're doing a tracking approach, which I'll show you a graph in a little bit there, you can control that um, outside air um, to a really tight degree based on the, the CO2 in the space. Um, fan operation allows for uh, morning warm up and night setback. So you could run just those auxiliary spaces um, to provide the morning warm up and fan operation, helping reduce stratification and higher static pressure allowed by the fan to, uh, to allow more diverse outlet options. Um, let's see. So yeah, sorry, I'm losing my mouse here. Uh, and when you look at the control sequence um, for a fan box and what that looks like, the DOAS unit, for the first stage of cooling, trying to find, there we go. My mouse will help here. So when you start to move off of dead band into the first stage of cooling, you've got a couple things going on. This is not necessarily 0% uh, percent fan speed. This is just at your minimum that you're gonna continue to run your fan and in the first stage of cooling. And then we wanna control that water valve, run that up to the peak uh, you know, fully open position before you start to move into that second stage of cooling. That way we're utilizing that water loop and cooling the space, you know, initially with that uh, hydronic system. Uh, fresh air damper, obviously, you know, between min and max um, position. Uh, second stage of cooling, that's when we start to ramp up that fan if you continue to warm up in the space. Pretty simple though. Uh, for heating, we've got... Uh, well, kind of the inverse. We've got uh, fan airflow. Really, we're trying to, to move as much of that return air, space return air, um, in through the unit first initially before we start to move into that second stage of heating and open up the, the hot water valve to, to heat up that, that airflow. 
uh, demand control ventilation. Is this is this a tactic being used on on your projects? Are you seeing more of it? Kind of a mixed mixed reaction here in the room. Yeah. So uh, go quickly through that. Essentially, um, again, there's a number of ways that you can achieve demand control ventilation. One idea here is the the tracking approach, where you simply uh, increase your uh, damper uh, airflow. So you're opening and closing the damper based on the CO2 reading in the space. So you'd have a, a CO2 measuring device um, within the space. So it might be your conference rooms, um, high density occupied spaces, um, where you can track that. All right. And then lastly, uh, I'm going to show you that the project um, in the case for hybrid systems um, I know there's a lot of words on here, but uh, sort of just reiterating that uh, combined approach. Usually we have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have about a fourth of the primary air, um, again, that you would have compared to an all air system. We, uh, we talked about that a little bit earlier. And typically we would see 30 to 40% energy savings compared to a traditional system. Um, just again, with that um, volumetric heat capacity boost with the water system. Um, so same uh, equipment we saw here as the uh, the first initial slide for this section. We've got our outside air being controlled through the DOAS unit that's supplying to the chill beams as well as the fan powered boxes. Looks like we've got fan powered boxes along the perimeter. In this case, um, you know, lots of flexibility in terms of uh, architecturally and um, you know again controlling the the comfort and the humidity in the space with this this system. Now, where exactly would you use one or the other? Um, and this is somewhat subjective, but we tried to, as best as we could, at least offer, you know, our thoughts in comparison. So a chill beam, you know, you don't have those moving components, those mechanisms with, you know, directly above the occupied space, uh, fan equipment moving around. So kind of gets a check mark for the, the noise aspect, um, typically less than NC30. Um, in most selections I've seen. Heating, uh, fan power does boxes. It's got all those options that you can add on with the electric heat and the additional reheat for the uh, hydronic, different placement of those. Architecturally, I, I put both check marks because really some architects love chilled beams. They love the look of them with the dual slot. Um, and you can also have the recessed unit that from the um, occupant perspective is just a slot diffuser. Um, but really, the fan powered box gives you an unlimited catalog of type of you know outlet configurations. Uh, maintenance, obviously, we don't have again just a refresh. There's no fan components within the chill beam, so that's much easier. And then, of course, turn down, which we talked about, fan box wins out. So, looking at uh, this case study, we've got uh, looking at individual zones, whether it's open office or the corridors. There's various things to, to consider in, in all designs, right? Acoustics, um, what's the NC level required for the space? What type of occupancy do we have? Um, and then the footprint um, and the loads. So I'm gonna go through and, and just talk about this particular project and ask the group here, which solution you would uh, select for your design based on this very brief and short summary of the space. Very limited info. Uh, Large external zones, we've got open office and perimeter load that we've got to deal with. So it's got uh, high heating and cooling requirement in the space and somewhat of a variable occupancy um, and less acoustic requirements or stringent re acoustic requirements. Uh, just taking a poll, show of hands, what, what type of product would you lay out based on you being experts now of these systems? Which one? Area. Just for the blue area, yeah. Open office with uh, perimeter. Yeah, you're not allowed to answer, Tom. Fan power box. Fan power box? Yeah. Yeah. So it's just less stringent acoustical. Yep. Yep, fan-powered box. 
So I think that makes a lot of sense here. We've got um, actually a lot of open offices with exposed ceiling now, but yeah, you could design it, turn it down. Peak is still below that NC level uh, threshold. Um, you've got the ability to duct to any type of diffuser. You've got that cooling coil and fan airflow to control the loads and the humidity in the space. So yeah, I think that's, that's most commonly what we hear. All right, moving into the corridors, a little more flexible acoustically, transient space. Um, corridors, we, you know, our thought was it's typically driven by architectural, um, you know, slots or, uh, or maybe egg crate, you never know. What, uh, what type of product do you think we would, you'd lay out here? I mean, there's, I'll admit, there's no right or wrong answer. Well, I, yeah, kind of is. But is anybody, is anybody throwing a comment in the chat? Nope. <laughs> All right. So kind of non committal, but a little bit with the chilled beams we're thinking here. All right. Yeah. So chilled beams along the corridor. All right. Nice continuous look with that slimline coupling. I think that's a good approach. All right, internal zones. Lots of discrete uh, small zones of, of control that we need to, to create here. Um, high variable load on in terms of intermittent uh, occupant loading. So, you know, maybe you've got uh, some turn down if you've got meetings versus one person or, you know, 10 people in there. Which product, what do we think? Both? Both. Right? Right? Yeah, chill beam. So just to reiterate that, you know, both um, could work well in these spaces, chill beams, Unoccupied, you could obviously close the water valve if space temperatures um, on set point. Primary air could be cut down if there's nobody in there. Same thing with the fan box. Well, if there's no, you could uh, VAV the primary air to the beam. Yeah, if there's no load. I was saying if if the space temp was satisfied, you know, you could you could cut back on the water. Right. If you're so if it in the unoccupied scenario or right. So Yeah, so um, again, uh, so Richard here had a question on, again, the turn down for chill beams. Um, so the only concern for chill beams when you're cutting the primary down too low is losing the induction through the, the coil. So it's not, it's not catastrophic. It's just that you might have, yeah, just more primary air that's kind of driving. You might have a little bit of dumping or, or 45 degree angle discharge at the beam, but yeah, it's not destroying um, anything. Yeah. 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 But you could absolutely uh, control that damper down on the primary air with the chill beam, just like you would another device. Yep. Good point of clarification. All right. Everybody said both. We're all winners. Uh, hybrid system implementation. So what actually was selected um, was, was the opposite of what we were suggesting and talking with the architect and engineer. I know that's nobody's ever had that happen before. Um, so what they selected was fan powered box for the corridors and the private smaller subzones, the private offices and conference rooms and chilled beams in the, uh, the open office. So architecturally, they wanted that look of the chilled beam above the workstations in the open office. And um, they liked the idea of the fan powered box 
in those uh, private office and corridor areas. So, yep, there's no wrong answer. But yeah, this was for um, Block 38, which was a, a Google project. Um, I believe is in Seattle, Washington, is the location of this project. So, in in Europe, uh, well, no, not hybrid design. I can't say I've seen that, but we've seen both of these products, um, especially chilled beams in um, hotels, in dorm rooms, um, Michigan, MSU, and uh, U of University of Michigan have uh, chill beams installed in the dormitory areas. Um, so that's I wouldn't say it's very common, but yeah, it's been it's been done in the past. Um, but yeah, now I haven't seen a hybrid approach on those particular projects. So they, the uh, MSU Wells Hall uh, did a four pipe heating cooling in the chilled beam. And it's, if you envision kind of a narrow uh, dorm room with above the, the doorway and the entryway where you walk into the dorm room, there's a bulkhead that they build out. And this would be very similar even to a hotel room, um, but you've got a recessed chilled beam inside of a, a cabinet up in the ceiling. And then there's a dual deflection grill that's pointing towards the perimeter. Um, so whether it's cooling or heating, you know, that offers good, good air distribution in the space. And those were dry coils. Those, those were not uh, low temp. All right. Any other questions? Finally, right on time, Tom. Yeah. How about a nice hand for Chris Burrow? Thank you. Yes, sir. Kept it on. All right. Okay. Some of you may have, Hans, I think you've seen some of this before, but it's, it's, going, it's going to be a little bit fast and furious. Um, yeah, we want to share. Yep. And we're going to go, be good. All right. Um, so I am uh, thinking about, I have this building, right? You, a lot of you have been here before and it's a eighties vintage building. So we did the roof, the roof is now gold standard roof. Um, but now we're looking at the envelope and I'm just imagining all these old buildings out there with crappy facades and hey, we're gonna have to electrify these buildings. You know, we're not gonna build all new, start from scratch buildings. We're gonna have to retrofit some of them. And we're not going to be able to put in all new glass structures. So we're going to have some challenges. And why don't, why don't you uh, advance a, a slide here to Cassidy? Yeah, this is the, hey, we're going to electrify. Can we? And then should we? And there are not, I'm aware of one full electric building being designed in the upper Midwest right now. And there's a ton of challenges. Um, go ahead, Cassidy. Yeah, so, so what's our constraint? Our constraint is, well, what's a facade? Right, we know that we can do um, a chill beam. Is not particular, you know. It's got it's challenging on the cooling side in the south. Up here, though, boy, we have a big delta T on the outside, and if we're constrained by our heat pump system, especially if it's hydronic, then we're going to have challenges at the facade. So, why? First of all, why are we limited to roughly that 105 to 120 degrees? on the hot water side of a heat pump system, who would like to venture a guess? Efficiency, what do you mean efficiency? We're trying to run our refrigeration circuit in sort of the safe operating zone of that compressor, right? Compressor has a desired range. As we push the capacity of the compressor, number one, we get less efficient and number two, when we don't have a lot of, um, what is it, 
we're not getting a lot of heat out of the outside air for an air-cooled system, we're really pushing the compressor to work harder. Geothermal systems different. They're not all gonna be geothermal. So we're gonna run out of capacity at a certain point. So fine, you know, over here it says, 105 to 125 degrees max, sort of that's weather dependent, right? Maybe it's only 105. So if our facade requires more than 500, 600 BTUs per square foot, like a tall facade like that, we're gonna have some challenges. So we, um, Chris showed us, we have a linear um, fan terminal where we can get decent BTUs per linear foot. Well, you gotta have somewhere to put them. They're more expensive than um, just uh, radiant uh, heat. So maybe some other ideas we can apply. Go ahead, Cassidy. Um, I often put this slide up and it's new. This is, I'm going backwards a little bit. This is just our generation for the United States. If we're gonna electrify a building, we should really think about where the power is coming from. So in 2020, we're 20 uh, renewables. 20 nuclear, 20 coal, 40 gas, right? And in two years, look at how much we've changed. <laughs> One and a half percent, like we are on our way. And, if, and we went backwards on nuclear because we're decommissioning, we're decommissioning a nuclear plant here in Wisconsin. A coal goes up and natural gas goes down. So progress, we've still got a lot of ways to go upward next slide please this is all the power in the united states well, is the, yeah this is us consumption measured in quadrillions of btus so if you'll notice you know we've got up top the orange 36.6 that is our generated power for buildings right um, notice the gray that follows that so quick math, what are we seeing for rejected energy just out of our power system? How much power do we get for the fuel input? What was that? 33%, that's right. So next slide, please. So two thirds of the power, where is it gone? This kind of sucks, right? But let's electrify, let's do it. So we, we get to a break even with a COP of three on the electric side compared to gas. Um, but just making sure everybody understands when you plug in your lamp, your hair dryer, your electric whatever at home, two thirds of the power that was used to generate whatever you're functioning is gone on the way there, which is, this is a fact. Um, it's different in different places around the United States. Let's go to the next slide. Where did it go? Some of its transmission lines, most of it's in the form of heat which is why when you see power plants, they're often next to a lake. So we're also warming up the fish, making it a little more like a hot tub. Next slide, please. Um, so you saw a couple slides ago where the power's generated from, the fuel source, right? So why do we want to switch to natural gas instead of coal? Coal is basically twice the greenhouse gas created compared to natural gas. So that is why the conversion. So if we just, got rid of coal, we'd be a lot better off. Next slide, how much coal are we still using? Wisconsin, last year, for the first time ever, did it, I don't know if anybody knew this, we just used more natural gas than we did coal. Which when we're talking about like, oh, more renewables, like we're so far, we're so, so far behind this, we're gonna be good for all electric. Like if we were all natural gas, we would be in way better shape than we are right now. We have a long way to go, a long way to go. Let's keep going. Um, this is just comparing 2020, 2021. In 2020, we were had COVID. 2021, we used a way more coal than we did in 2020. Uh, we used more natural gas too. Also look at the difference in renewables. It's like as a, as a, small cut of what we're doing. It's just not, I'm trying to even find it. Other renewables right there. You got a long way to go, a long way to go. All right, let's keep going. Uh, but we have till 2050, right? No, we kind of don't, kind of don't. Next, 
Um, these are the states that have electrification sort of teed up in state uh, government. So it's been proposed. It's um, now my brother came in a couple of sessions ago. Denver actually put it in the law. Their code, we saw from Chris's presentation, Colorado does not have, they're not, they don't follow um, 90.1. They do whatever they want. Well, what they're doing is we're going to be electrified. And a couple slides from now, I'll show you what that is. This is the flip side of it. These are the states that are, have legislation passing that you can't ban gas. So this is the other side of the equation. Um, can you see the state lines? It's hard to see. Okay, all right, it's just my angle. Okay, so for example, Michigan introduced a preemptive, you can't ban gas in Michigan, even though there's also legislation that says, we're gonna electrify. And the all electric building that I'm aware of in the upper Midwest is gonna be in Ann Arbor. So interesting, right? Let's keep going. This is the thing I was mentioning before. This is going into effect. So design engineers like you in Colorado are designing all electric buildings. What does that mean? We'll get to that in a couple of slides. Keep going. So you've got your commercial industrial space. So let, let's say we're gonna do airflow as all electric. It's gonna be a challenge. Next slide. Well, we don't have any makeup air here. That's good but we do have a bunch of rooftop units. So these rooftop units would be need to be converted from uh, air conditioning plus gas heat. They now need to be cold climate heat pump rooftop units. Who makes one? No one, not over five tons, no one. So there's no market for it yet. So I can't replace these. I gotta go to a new system. Next slide. My warehouse has infrared heaters. I would have to find an electric solution for that. Unit heaters, I don't have any because I have infrared, but it's the same boat. So certainly challenging for commercial industrial hybrid type spaces. Let's keep going. So I, I've got to convert my building. What can I do? I can generate power here with solar. I can, I'm working on the envelope right now. So I hired this great consultant to work on my roof. So what did he do? He said, here's the roof you're gonna build. I'm gonna write an RFP for it. I'm gonna get contractors out there to bid on it. I'm gonna supervise the installation of it. It was a dynamite plan. I really liked it. We put it in, $400,000 roof, beauty. My envelope, totally different animal. I can call a glass company, but what are they gonna guarantee? They can guarantee what the glass is. Can they guarantee my envelope? Uh, there, there may be a company that can help us with that, but that's gonna be tricky for every building that's already built, that's older than a couple of years that didn't spend a lot of money in their facade. So it's a huge challenge. So, and what does that get back to? All the way back to what are we gonna do on our envelope? Are we gonna be able to get away with low 120 degree water assuming that that's what we're getting out of our heat pump system. So we've got some tension here. Um, I'm gonna propose an alternative option here to supplement our hydronic system. Let's go next, some math. Um, real quick, this is, we're gonna go to, we're talking about electrification. So when I switch my fuel source from gas to electric, am I reducing my carbon footprint? So here's the, here's the math. When I burn a therm of natural gas, 116.65 pounds of CO2 per therm. We go to the next one. This is electricity. How much, how many pounds created by megawatts? I'm gonna save everybody having to do the math here in a couple of slides. But let's, yeah, so here's the, here's the totality of the system um, in pounds per, therm and pounds per kilowatt hour. This, these are my rates. So I write the check for these rates for the building. So if we do an example here real quick, go ahead. Yeah, so a 60 pound per hour humidifier, I can power that with electricity or I can power that with gas, which would be a lower carbon footprint. 
Oh, come on. Gases. Next slide, please. There we go. So one third. One third. Why? Because the equivalent waste, you know, I'm pumping gas into a turbine, wasting two thirds of it. That's my ratio. So is gas really the enemy here? It will be someday. It will be someday. It is not now. Okay, well, fine. We're maybe going to electrify buildings anyways, because you've seen that this, the country is moving towards, this is what we want. Whether it's good for us or bad for us, this is what we're going to do. Okay, next slide, please. So we're going to look at two different generation systems. The one on the left is combined heat and power. And the one on the right is the solar installation that I already have in this building, which is a 114 kilowatt system. Okay, next. Now what, are we, what are we trying to do? Part of it is we're trying to shave the peak off the building. So let's say in the winter time, if you're running an all electric system and it gets really cold outside and you are using supplemental electric heat, that's terrible. That's a COP of one. It's four times the cost of natural gas. It's extremely expensive, right? So that's what we're trying to do, whether or not we're looking at solar or generation. We're not trying to become a power plant. Some places can. We can't do that here. Long story. Um, we're just trying to shave the peaks off and have a, a flatter baseline. Next slide, please. So here's a tractor. We're going to get into the, the code generation. Um, tractors are fun. They have a driver, they have a fuel source, they have an engine, they have a radiator. All right, let's look at another picture of a tractor. There's another tractor. Turns out John Deere uses Yanmar for a lot of their engines. That's the company that makes the engine that we're dealing with. Next slide. Those are what the engines look like. Next slide. This is what it is. So uh, combined heat and power is gas in, electricity out, and hot water out. Oh, how does that work? Well, when you ride on a tractor out front, there is a radiator. Why is there a radiator there? It is the analogous to the water, you know, building a power plant next to the lake, right? In this case, we're gonna use the building as the radiator because the waste heat is free. So what can we supplement what can we use that uh, um, additional heat for? Well, we've got this challenge with our perimeter. Maybe this is a marrying up the two systems is, is beneficial. Go ahead. Um, quick, here's what it looks like. It's a box. It's, it's an engine. That's all it is. Just looks a lot like your boat engine with a different kind of box. Okay. There's a bunch of companies that are in this combined heat and power alliance. So this is a real thing. It's not just something that I found wandering around the ash ratio. There's a lot of companies that are in on this. Some significantly larger systems, some very small. Ours is pretty small. Go ahead. Um, this is this is the, it comes in 208 or 480 volt three phase. It produces about 200,000 BTUs per 35 kW system. So what we are not trying to do is become the boiler plant. What we are trying to do is supplement the boiler plant. If we can turn off the boilers or if we can turn off the heat pump and use this for power, or I'm sorry, for hot water, great. Maybe it's domestic hot water, maybe it's building heating, maybe it's something else. Um, it can be, it's basically showing you in the inlet and outlet just a 10 degree delta T, can change your flow, get, it's 200,000 BTUs per system. Great, okay. Uh, you can skip this slide. All right, here's the alternative. Here's solar. This is on the building. Uh, that was fast. That's good. There, we can look at it one more time. I even have a video, but we're, we're going to skip it in the interest of time. So having solar for a while, you kind of go, man, I bought 114 kilowatts of solar energy. So I should be getting that all the time but it just somehow doesn't work out that way. It's still a good investment. They, I'm getting exactly what the solar company produced, but it's this, you know, 140 megawatts, 130 megawatts. It's, 
it's operating just fine, but it's not, it's a little bit different than buying a 35 kW engine. Why? When you buy a 35 kW engine, you get 35 kW 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. So while the power over on the solar side is variable, power on the engine side is consistent. Okay, next slide. This is what I paid for it. Um, it's been a really good investment. What they're saying here, when they're really taking a lot of advantage of depreciation is about a five-year payback. I, don't, I would call it six. Um, it's become actually more expensive now, even though all the solar is like, there's more solar available. Um, if you go to the next slide, that's the back. Um, this is the, let me just take a look. Um, the 207, 444, that's my initial investment. I got money back from Focus on Energy. I got a tax credit. There's my cost. Um, roughly an eight-year return. You know, it's, it's still, it's a fairly good investment. And I'm only doing this because if someone puts in solar, what do we say? Good for you. Good for you for working on the environment. Good for you for investing in our future. Good, 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 good. So let's call solar the gold standard. And then we're gonna compare against the gold standard to see how we do. Next slide. This is the um, confusing CHP image that we get from our manufacturer. Can anybody tell me what they're getting out of this? Because we're gonna do the math in a second. It's just kind of saying it's better, right? Better is, better is hard to sell. Overall efficiency is 1.6 times greater. It's basically taking into account our heat loss over here. Oh, I moved away from the computer, didn't I? Well, nobody's seeing me. <laughs> over there, it's saying that um, um, the overall efficiency is better because the waste heat is free. The generator is about 32% efficient. What is our power plant? An equivalent. It is the same. So we can only go up if we make any use of the hot water. The one advantage of having the power plant is you don't have to buy a generator. That's it. So you need to find a way to return your money on the generator purchase. Go ahead. I don't like their math. Let's do our math. Is this cut off? Okay. If you use the generator 364 days a year, you have to service it one day. 364 days a year, 24 hours a day what will the carbon footprint impact be? And all I did was use those, use the math from the charts before, whether I use gas, whether I use electric, how many pounds of CO2 I create. And it is from roughly 600,000 to under 400,000. So depending on how you do your math, it's a one third reduction or it's a 50%. It's significant by burning gas. So again, do we electrify? Absolutely, we can. Is this a beneficial system as well? It is, it is. What are we not doing here? We're not burning coal and we're not transporting it. And we're using the waste heat in the building. This, this assumes we're using the waste heat in the building, but in Wisconsin, we have a lot of places we can use waste heat. Next slide. This is the operational cost if I bought a 35 kW CHP machine, which is about $25,000 a year of savings and includes spending some time on service and all that kind of stuff. So there's a return on it. Otherwise it wouldn't be worth doing. There's the noble, the noble greenhouse gas reduction. Good, but you can also get a mathematical payback for an owner to justify it. That's great. Okay, um, skip. Um, this is my comparison of the gold standard, right? If solar is indeed gold standard, how do we do? So I took my, I'm going to point again, sorry, people on TV. I took, that was the average of three years, right? 135 megawatt hours generated. 
savings about, this is exactly what we're getting, about $16,000, $17,000 of savings a year. Good. As utilities go up, that payback gets better, right? Um, my rebates and all that kind of stuff, great, 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 great. ROI, five years, sounds good. Here's CHP. Oh, I got to back up a second. The I re-ran the, with the new federal rebates and the new cost of solar. The payback is somewhere between 9 and 11 years. It's not as attractive as it was. Why? I don't know. Maybe people have figured out how to make more money at solar or whatever it is. So 11-year return now. So I bought solar when it was a good idea to buy solar, I guess. But the ROI for CHP, again, if you're using the engine all year and you have a place to use the heat, right? So where can you use the heat? Um, let's push. Next slide. So if we're limited on our base design by this water condition that the heat pump is providing, we, have a ter we, have, we may have a terrible challenge or we can't do it or we have to add a boiler or whatever, right? With the CHP design, you can supplement the hot water supply in the winter. You can use the hot water for domestic. You can use it for all sorts of different stuff in the summer if you're able to. But even if you use the CHP for a good chunk of the year, you're gonna generate a return for sure, but you're also gonna free up your ability to design around the building. You may not be able to buy linear, uh, linear fan powered terminals all the way around because your envelope may not sustain that design. I can see that being a problem. You, you know, I, I, there's plenty of examples, you out there in TV land, where you've got a customer who's got a building that they've got buildings from the 50s, the 70s, the 90s, and then recent stuff well, and they want to develop a campus-wide plan. This is a solution for a campus-wide plan to help you get over the hump. Now someday, CHP is gonna be useless. Why? Because most of our grid will be renewable. Maybe we're nuclear, all that kind of stuff. Maybe, but we're always gonna need, probably gonna need to supplement um, our perimeters. So this is just a, a method of doing it. Um, I, I don't know if I have a lot left. Um, oh, this, yeah, this is my last slide. One of the big challenges if you have all this hot water is what are you gonna do with it in the summer? So this is, a, and we did a seminar on this and it's recorded if you haven't seen it before, it's an hour from a few months ago. This is a low energy liquid desiccant dehumidifier. So in the summertime, I need a DOAS unit, right? What's my DOAS unit supposed to do? It's taking care of the latent load. What does a dehumidifier do? Takes care of the latent load. Notice, only 120 degree water, water, to generate to get rid of the moisture out of the system. And notice the cooling source does not to be, need to be 42 degrees; it's 50. So what does this pair up with perfectly? Sure, seems like a heat pump design. So what do I? Maybe I supplement. Um, maybe my heat pump's running as I'm, I'm using like a heat recovery chiller, or maybe I have a place to go with my extra hot water in the summertime. So how did I do on time? Where are we at? Oh, I went a little, oh, three minutes early. Maybe I went a little too fast. So there's a longer session in the past that's been recorded about CHP that goes through this a little bit more slowly instead of the fast and furious. It's an interesting system, but it does generate a payback. It does fall into this beneficial electrification that we're looking at for our not too distant future. Um, we're not all there yet, but we, I don't know, unless you're, eh, I don't know. I think before I retire, we're gonna be designing some all electric buildings for sure. So um, if we're gonna go to all electric buildings, and I'm just kind of recapping for me and Chris here, low lift systems are certainly going to be part of the design, number one which means either these um, dry fan coils, chilled beams, radiant systems, 
And of course, if you're gonna try to cut energy, displacement systems are a good fit too. So there's a lot to fit in. We're not gonna be able to just drop rooftops on buildings anymore and get away with it. So, hey, it's gonna be an interesting time and uh, full of challenges. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming here today. Thank you, live audience, appreciate it. And thank, thanks everybody out there